Final Girls are synonymous with horror. You know and love many of them. From Laurie Strode of Halloween fame. Sydney Prescott from Scream. What a babe. Awooga! <laughs> there are so many, but there is one underdog who I find fascinating, especially in the first two movies. The Hellraiser movies. Kirsty. That's right. But not only are we going to talk about Kirsty, we are talking about her antagonistic counterpart, Julia, and the dichotomy they share in the first two Hellraiser movies. Give me a hell yeah for horror and come find out. What up y'all, welcome back to Phantom of the Indie Review. I am your host. The Lament Configuration is a piece of shit, Dill. We are on the journey of 4,000 subscribers by Halloween Eve, and I'm not gonna front with y'all. I don't think I'm gonna reach that goal, but the people that are contributing to the channel, y'all mean so much to me. We are a community here at Dread Dread, and we have so much fun. So if you're new or reoccurring and you haven't subscribed yet, give your boy a subby. And if you wanna enter the dark, dank hallways of hell, Come hang out with your boy. Hellraiser is personally one of my favorite underrated horror movies of all time, and it is based off the short novella, The Hellbound Heart. Such a cool name. Clive Barker, the boy you know and love wrote it. In Morocco, Frank Cotton, a hedonist who is someone that puts pleasure above all, buys a special puzzle box that we know to become the Lament Configuration. The box is said to open the door to a realm of unworldly pleasure. And Frank Cotton essentially becomes a focal point of the movie where when he opens the box, he ends up missing. Later on, Frank's brother Larry moves into the same house. He intends to rebuild his relationship with his second wife, Julia. And this is where we get right out of the gates that Julia is a very unlikable lady. At first, you're like, maybe she's just high maintenance. She doesn't love Larry as much as you would hope. And I'm not gonna lie, for a lot of people, this movie doesn't really quite meet the criteria of a good horror because it's a slow burn, slow pace, but I always found it riveting. It's great storytelling. I mean, Clive Barker got to write and direct this movie. It's a passion project of his that he got to transform off the page onto the big screen, and I think it's phenomenal. One thing we learn about Julia, however, is, yeah, we realize she doesn't quite love Larry because years prior she had an affair with Frank and she has a fascination and desire to get him back moving into his house makes her feel spiritually closer to him and it's quite devastating. Kirsty Cotton is not quite prevalent in this movie the most but when she does come into it she does have a huge role and pair of shoes to fill in facing the Cenobites. As the movie progresses Julia ends up finding out that essentially Frank's spirit and like his body is up in the attic area of the house and he begs her to help revitalize him and revive him back to his normal self and by doing this she essentially has to kill innocent bystanders bring them to the house lure them in offer them sexual romances and then she brutally kills them and it's quite eerie as we see Frank Cotton evolve he's very disturbing looking you know, for the late 80s, early 90s, whatever, the gore, practical effects is very disturbing. And what this movie lacks in abundance of intense scenes, I feel like the graphics really do show when they go all out. Kirsty, who is Larry's teenage daughter and Frank's niece, ends up coming to stay with her dad and Julia for a little while. And there's some minor tensions. Obviously, she doesn't really like Julia. She's trying her best for her dad, but Julia doesn't care about her. But the movie starts to get a little chaotic. When Kirsty sees Julia bringing a man into the house and she follows her to the attic where she finds Frank. And Frank is just a decrepit, disgusting, mutilated mess. Frank is obviously desperately trying to get back to life to his full form, so he attacks Kirsty. But Kirsty ends up evading the situation and also stealing the puzzle box. Collapsing shortly thereafter, awakening in a hospital, Kirsty is laying in the bed with the box and she's trying to figure it out and this is where she accidentally solves it and mistakenly reveals the lore and legends of the Cenobites and she's just in the wrong place at the wrong time type situation. Cenobites are extra dimensional beings that essentially reside in hell even though they don't quite vaguely say hell in the first movie they say it's pretty much a land of unbearable pleasure. And when we get the main handful of Cenobites introduced into the movie, first Kirsty summons the monster called the Engineer from which she narrowly escapes. And then the Cenobites leader, referred to as Pinhead. They essentially want to take Kirsty, make her suffer the unbearable pleasure of what is their world because they think she wanted that. She opened the box. Clearly she had to. But then she kind of makes a bargain with the devil, so to speak, when she says, 
When Pinhead says no one has ever escaped our wrath, what makes you think we're going to spare you? And she says, I know where Frank Cotton is. And this kind of entices and intrigues Pinhead because no one has ever escaped them. And as scary as Frank pretty much regrowing himself in Kirsty's father's attic is, it's kind of a saving grace because she now has a key to maybe get spared by the Cenobites. And for the rest of the movie, she ultimately becomes a final girl where she has to fight off the evil of the Cenobites of her uncle Frank, all unfolding into a brutal, fantastic finale that to this day kind of gives me the chills. A tragic note with Julia as the movie progresses also is that her love for Frank is so undying that she ends up getting betrayed by Frank because as he's feeding more and more off humans to regenerate his strength, he kills her because he doesn't give any care about her clearly he's manipulating her so she suffers the consequences as Kirsty for now defeats the Cenobites and though yes there are like nine Hellraiser movies excluding the reboot and remakes whatever the reason I'm talking about one and two strictly is because it focuses on Kirsty and Julia's dynamic and I feel like kind of sad because their their storyline fizzles out after the second one, even though we do get a cameo from Kirsty in part three, and maybe she's in a few more a few more moments from the franchise, but Julia's kind of X out of the whole franchise. But we get to the sequel that a lot of people find really bad. Even from someone who is as prolific as Robert Eggers, who gave this movie just a half a star. He has very little hype for this movie. The movie starts in the 1920s India. British military officer Elliot Spencer is transformed into a Cenobite pinhead after opening the Lament configuration. And that's one thing I do love about this franchise is that every movie from one to two all the way spanning, they do unfold the lore of the Cenobites and the Lament configuration. I really love part three and four specifically. So if you guys want to see me do that in another video, give me a thumber because it's such a fascinating story. Shortly after her father is killed by Frank Cotton, Kirsty Cotton is admitted into a psychiatric hospital and she is interviewed by a man named Dr. Chenard, who ends up becoming another villain of sorts throughout the movie. She essentially has more of a dominant role in part two as the final girl, and she meets a counterpart, a young mute patient named Tiffany, who demonstrates an amazing aptitude for puzzles, which, you know, is kind of leaning into catering to the plot. She'll be able to solve the element configuration. But one thing I do enjoy about the sequel is even though it very is slow the first one's slow but this one's even slower is the introduction to julia's character again i really feel like she kind of takes on that frank cotton role where she is trying to build herself back up but she is just evil and diabolical along the way after hearing kersey's story dr chenard is obsessed with the lament configuration and he has the mattress that was used for murder at the Cotton's residence brought to the facility. And he convinces a mentally ill patient to lie on it and cuts himself with a straight razor. The resulting blood frees a skinless Julia from the Cenobite dimension. And honestly, I will say that part is very disturbing to see on film. When you see Julia come back, it's very eerie, grotesque, bloody. And Julia's character becomes significant because she is slowly seducing and tantalizing Chenard as well. The same way Frank had did that to her in the first one, she kind of learned the ropes to try to get back to being a full human. So Julia seduces him and she has him bring more mentally ill patients to his home for her to feed on and regenerate. And then that little mute character, Tiffany, she ends up getting kidnapped by Chenard and Julia. And they try to force her to unlock the Lament configuration because she's a whiz at puzzles. So they can enter the labyrinth-like world of Pinhead and the Cenobites. Uh, Kirsty, Julia, Tiffany, Chenard, they all end up going to what I assume is hell whatever the Cenobite dimensional world is. They have a brief run-in with Frank Cotton where Julia kind of gets her revenge on him. You know, all that torment, all that built up tormented pain that she had from being killed by the man. And Julia is essentially the henchman of Chenard and a main villain as Kirsty and Tiffany are just trying to find their way home. When Kirsty encounters Frank Cotton in the labyrinth, who reveals that he tricked her by pretending to be her father, Julia appears and destroys Frank in revenge for killing her, allowing Kirsty to escape. Julia doesn't get a very satisfying ending when she is finally killed off by a vortex that opens within the labyrinth, leaving only her skin behind. Kirsty and Tiffany reconnect and attempt to escape, but are ambushed by Chenard, who is becoming a Cenobite. He is essentially growing into a full fledged Cenobite and it's very creepy and unnerving especially because he wants to be we see with Pinhead and some of his henchmen that they didn't want to be this and they became it slowly maybe Pinhead wanted to be it but Chenard definitely wants to and I like it too because we get another brief cameo of Pinhead and his rascals and they seem to be 
still the bad guys, but with a little edge of goodness to them. Because again, they meet Kirsty and he's like, I'm gonna stop, I can't keep sparing you. And then when Chenard comes, they're like, We're gonna fight you. We're gonna like forget about Kirsty and Tiffany for a second and go after the ultimate evil where Chenard pretty much screws them all up and it's pretty insane. Chenard traps Kirsty and Tiffany. Kirsty finds Julia's skin and wears it to distract Chenard. Giving Tiffany enough time to solve the lament configuration again. This is where Chenard is killed and Tiffany and Kirsty get to go back to their world. Earth, life, whatever fuck. And the movie ends with two moving men are removing Dr. Chenard's belongings from his home elsewhere. One is pulled inside the mattress and the other witness a mysterious pillar rise from within. And it's the ultimate iconic creepy pillar that Pinhead Soul is trapped in, but... That's it. So yeah, for the most part, these two movies are really great. I really love the dynamic contrast between good and evil of Kirsty and Julia. I ended up liking Julia a lot more in the second one. The first one, she really annoyed me. I was like, dude, this character sucks. But the second one, she embraces that villainy and becomes more of a standalone character. Kirsty, she grows more of a backbone. She becomes, she becomes more likable and heroic and you really root for her. And I just feel like it's a great moment for the movie because a lot of times you get one final girl but in this one you get two sides of one coin essentially and it's very interesting well, all right guys that's the video what do you think about it comment down below who's your favorite final girl of all time let me know do you like the hellraiser franchise or do you think it's a dud because you know some of them are hit or miss but i really like the first four at least which is pretty good i'm gonna keep it real with you guys it's been a great video so subscribe give me a thumber Hit that ding -a ling button harassing you and telling you, hey, it's me, I'm here. And I'm going to say it one time for the one time and two time for the O's. Give me a hell yeah for horror. Or I will tear your soul apart. <laughs> the power is reawakened.